this is a dream of every molecular biologist to de- get his gene of interest to to find gene therapy and but the end it seems like tell me what you think you don't need all this basic research all you needed to know you don't need the, the rubs which rub which is my interest um you, all you need to know is the gene that is defective and try well yeah uh i wanted to demis- dis- demystify a few uh, a few things because I come from the same perspective that, that you come. And uh, all I wanted to say is that sometimes uh, things that we thought were very important were not, and others that we thought were not so important are actually very important. So the key to this is actually to have uh, um, collaborators that are experts in the different areas uh, 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 to work together uh, and complement uh, and, uh, and 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 find the the right path. So uh, I think that's what uh, I learn a lot with the ophthalmologist, uh, even in the, in terms of, I mean, the way he approached this and uh, and what uh, uh, really it was uh, it was quite a, a learning experience and uh, and some things. I mean, uh, perhaps I made too strong a point or I made it uh, too simple. I mean, it's not, but but also luck is uh, is really uh, uh, very important because all of a sudden, you know, you had the loss of function mutation, uh, you had uh, the eye that turns out to be a, a good uh, a good system, and we could not predict it that uh, in, in the beginning. On the other hand, uh, I think my medical training made me um, made me l- more keen to do this because I think uh, in a lot of uh, people uh, non uh, most of you are not medically trained and uh, and so uh, so uh, you are sometimes a bit afraid about uh, about uh, uh, venturing a little bit out of your comfort zone and um, and for me that was more natural because uh, I spoke the language and uh, I could understand. And it was also my own interest because when when this happened, and uh, um, I was obviously as a cell biologist very interested in 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 the pathogenesis. And then you know I did a lot of work on Rab GTPases and then Rab twenty seven turned out to be a very interesting story, completely independent of uh, of, uh, of of choroidremia. But 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 it was always there, I mean it was always there this this aim of the application and sometimes it's just it's just belief that uh, or or something or or, or motivation that uh, that you want to pursue that path and uh, and and it's not uh, it's not easy uh, but you persist on it. Yeah. Questions. Thank you. Do you want do you want the microphone? No. No. Okay. <laughs> the, well, okay. I have a question for Joel. Um, at the risk of seeming uh, overly aggressive, I I wonder what is the motivation. I can understand the motivation for doing like one or two synthetic chromosomes, but for doing okay. all sixteen synthetic chromosomes, and it just it seems like it's a lot of resources and a lot of time. You know when those resources could be used to do other things and the time could be used to solve diseases or something. So, so what keep, why, you know, you learned a lot from doing one or two chromosomes. Why, it seems like the, uh, they're diminishing returns, you know, by the time you get to chromosome 16. So what, it, why, keep, why is it important to do all 16, make synthetic copies of all 16 chromosomes in yeast? Can I answer just for a second? He's doing disease on the side. Okay, so but you could put, you could shift your resources to disease. Yes. Okay. So that's a really good question, and that's why it took us. That's one of the reasons why it took us so long to get the project funded. Like we started working on it, like 2006, and didn't really get funding for it until, like, May, our first funding was a Microsoft like seed grant, um, where. I convinced them that revision control systems that people use for software, like we need similar things for genome editing. I, um, I think that 
there's some things that you, well, there's some things that we want to do that we can really only do by doing a large scale project like this. So for example, doing the stop code on recoding is useful functionality added to yeast. And you have to edit the yeast throughout the genome to do it. And you could say, well, you could do that using homologous recombination to do that one by one. Um, getting rid of all of the repeats to see the function of repeats in the yeast genome, like really you have to get rid of them all. Um, you could do it one by one. Um, putting in the LOXP sim um, recombination sites. So what that lets us do, so I'm sorry, I missed Charlie, I missed, Charlie, I missed your talk. Um, it was just like the travel was too hard and I was either on the plane or passed out when you were speaking. Well, it might be better, it might be better. So, um, but so it lets you do screens like synthetic lethality, but um, like letting the yeast do all sorts of copy number variations. So for the yeast project, there are a lot of things that are proving to be useful that we could really only do by doing it genome-wide. So, um, so now in terms of return on investment for what we're doing versus other things, you know, the costs have come down so much. And like you could say the same thing about genome sequencing, like after we've sequenced one genome, why do we have to worry about sequencing another? But because the costs have come down so much, um, it opens up new possibilities. And one of the things that maybe has been driving genome synthesis costs to come down are projects like ours. So, um, so like in the end, I think it was worth it. Um, and I'm happy for the six, eight, nine years I devoted to it with only getting like one or two papers out and like convincing my postdocs it's worth sticking on this project because we're gonna like build something great. So um, it's a huge question for people talking about mammalian and doing like, you know, what's the point in synthesizing mammalian genome? And there, you know, I'm a little harder pressed to say that like right now is the time to really start a mammalian genome project. But on the other hand, um, it's really taught us a lot about synthetic chromosomes, and I think where my group's research is going to go, at least, is not really synthetic genomes, but more functional synthetic chromosomes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't arguing with doing a couple of chromosomes. It was just like. No. I. You know, what do you learn? You know. Yeah. Just further down the line, number yep. fourteen. Yeah. So is your aim entirely basic research? You could imagine using this. Oh no, a lot of it's industrial. Yeah. So, for example, for strain engineering. So for strain engineering, there are like there are a lot like it's very useful to be able to um, engineer an industrial microbe in order to maximize production of some product. And right now, like a lot of that just sort of trial and error with just standard mutagenesis. And what we found in I guess some papers that I'm counting in yeast and other like other work going on is it's incredibly powerful for pathway engineering to take a pathway, put it on a chromosome of its own. Um, put in these LOXP sites that let the cell try different copy numbers, select the ones that do best, and go from there. It, like, you know, it seems like, oh, standard mutagenesis should work fine, but it's really doing like, a lot better, a lot faster. Um, like the reason is that we get a lot of yeast cells in a test tube that are all reorganizing their genomes in different ways, and it becomes very useful. Questions? More questions? Yes, John. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for for Ben Lenner. Maybe I missed something uh, during your talk, but uh, about transger uh, transgenerational inheritance. But uh, do you know uh, because uh, some epigenetics marks can be erased or reprogrammed during uh, after fertilization? And have you an idea why uh, your specific transgen is still expressed? Uh, no. So why? this rare example does show epigenetic inheritance and the rest of the genome does not? No. I mean, we think it's to do with this particular chromatin state that it's this um, heterochromatic repressed locus in the germline that is then activated every generation, which is a very unusual um, epigenetic thing. Um, but why it happens, we don't know. Didn't you say it had sent all the other repeats were behaving the same way, the natural repeats in the genome? So, so some of them, the ones which are repressed by the same histone um, modification seem to behave the same way um, to, a, to a, a lesser extent, so in the genome. So some, it's something to do with the chromatin 
this particular chromatin state that is temperature sensitive. So, so you think that this is the end of, I mean, I mean, you, you try to, to understand what is the mechanism maybe, but is this the beginning of trying to understand inheritance of epigenetic markers? Where are you going with it? Okay, maybe it's too... Well, we would obviously like to know if this is used anywhere, either in C. elegans, connecting to proper higher level phenotypes, fitness, life history traits, or in other species. I mean, it may not be used for anything in C. elegans or other species. Um, so we're systematically testing all of that, basically. Um, the other thing we work on, which I didn't talk about, is just these one generation effects. So there are many more one generation effects where the, the physiology of the parents affects the traits in the next his, the next generation, and there, <laughs> one of the the big influences in silicons is the the age of the mother. So the the very young mothers are producing offspring which are very different throughout the throughout their lives. This is the the dominant cause of phenotypic variation in the lab, actually. We think um, so. The, and this one is partially to do with the loading of a protein complex into the embryos, so it changes over time. Um, and we don't understand the mechanism underlying this at all. You know, this is not probably a chromatin-based anything. It's it's probably a protein-based effect. I want to. So I want to say one more thing about the cost of the project. So no, because like no, 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 no. Because no. when we started the project, DNA DNA cost. No. That's right. No, because I was thinking more about it. Like seriously. Supported him in his very mean question. Serious, it's not, I mean, when we started the project, it was like a dollar a base for synthetic DNA and like 12 million bases. Like that's $12 million just for the DNA. And then like everything else is like $50 million costing if everything had been done at the cost of the beginning. But now DNA costs are like down to 10 cents to one cent, depending on like at what stage it is. So then if you think about more like in the end, this cell to redo it would cost between $100,000 and a million dollars. Like then, like it becomes more reasonable, and it, and I think like that's that's very that's very, like that's like there's a lot of exciting stuff you can do in that range. So I mean that's less than PI salary for a year. Yeah, no, depending on the PI. I'm not saying not my salary. Depending on the PI. <laughs> not in France. But is it going to? Are you going to be able to do it faster the second time? Oh yeah, definitely. You do it faster because, first of all, you can order bigger pieces. So a lot of the entry stage um, work that we had to do, um, you don't have to do. So it's, yeah, you can order a bit, there are better, you know, better methods for, so you know, much how much faster. So I wouldn't want to, uh, <sighs> like if you listen to Twist, they have the capacity to do it tomorrow. Um, in the end, like I don't know how much, I don't know how much faster. I mean, one. Actually, you might be able to do it very, very quickly. Well, like the the part of it that is taking the longest time now is working out the bugs. Like you know, you order a chromosome, you put it together, you find a fitness defe defect. Working out what nucleotide caused the fitness defect can take months. Now, I want to ask uh, <coughs> So uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, what is the phenotype of a mouse without uh, rep one in the retina? It has the same phenotype. So I um, I showed you the carrier. Um, so the carrier uh, mouse uh, has retinal degeneration. Yeah, it's the same phenotype. Yeah, the same phenotype. Although we have not looked at the choroid in um, in 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 in. Uh, in great detail, so we don't know if there's also degeneration of the choroid. But uh, in terms of uh, RPE and photoreceptors, it is pretty similar. Yeah. You can try to recover this with the injection. Yeah, we could. We could recover. Yeah. 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 I. I. I just didn't. I didn't show you the the functional analysis because it's quite slight, and even I don't understand very well the, all the electroretinograms and all that. There's slight changes that are sort of normalization of, uh, that imply better uh, vision, that uh, that was all done. And mice cannot talk. Yeah, I, actually, I have to say uh, that, that um, an interesting comment. Uh, there is a disease called LCA, Leber's congenital amaurosis, who's, uh, who's now 
um, uh, has been out uh, out of uh, Philadelphia, and there's been a company called Spark Therapeutics that's now uh, uh, been approved by the FDA to license this. So they're there two or three years ahead of uh, Nightstar for choroidremia in for this disease, and uh, and. Uh, uh, and the interesting thing was that the preclinical work uh, in that case was harder because they were first ones, but it was much simpler because it's a disease the, that involves no electrical activity in a much more, um, a much more dramatic disease with uh, no electrical activity. So the rescue and the little blip will give you, you know, uh, a proof of concept in terms of, for chorodremia that was much more difficult so our preclinical work, because of the lethality, the conditional knockouts, the, 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 the subtlety of the phenotype, all that work was much uh, more difficult. But now, clinically, chorodremia is much more attractive than, uh, than, than, than LCA because it's a much more severe dramatic disease. So the, the kids by age 15, they're almost blind. So it's very hard to, and then much rarer because LCA is heterogeneous and this is just a subpopulation of these. And so, so it's interesting because everything that was bad, uh, it's a complete switch uh, in preclinical and clinical in terms of these the two diseases. Glaucoma is one of these complex diseases. There's many. But you don't find rep one. No, 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 no. What? But what? It could happen. No. No, in terms of expression level, not uh, in terms of. Yeah. No, our major work now is actually on macular degeneration, age-related macular degeneration, because it involves RPE changes that are actually quite uh, similar to the ones we've seen in our chorodremia mice. So. We're, we're coming from a perspective of now pure pathogenesis because nothing is known and there it's just completely virgin that uh, trafficking defects and uh, it's, it's uh, macular degeneration is thought of an extracellular disease and we're trying to make the point that it is definitely an intracellular disease that then has an extracellular manifestation later on. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, for Ben actually and uh, it's about, so you <coughs> said that you talked about how the model of transgenerational epigenetics inheritance you have is not a good system for transferring information. And that it's like not represent, it's not, it's not going to be representative of like a Lamarckian inheritance model. But, yes. but, so do, I think that's like downplaying a little bit that kind of idea because you can have like acute selection that happens within just one generation, right? And that can definitely affect the fitness. So, like, it, even though it's not necessarily a long-term natural selection thing, like a change in a gene, I mean, don't, how do you feel about that? I don't know. So I think this could be a selectable trait, if you see what I mean, that they have this ability to transfer information. But because it has this very short half-life relatively on an evolutionary scale, it's not like environmental the quad information that then gets fixed. So it's not like the giraffe stretching its neck and then all its descendants forever are gonna have a long neck as a thing. But yes, this can just just as an you know, just as a heat shock response within a generation can be beneficial. It could be beneficial across generations. So in a, in toy models it's easy to come up with um, conditions where this kind of thing could be beneficial. As long as the the generation time is shorter than the time scale that the environment is changing, then it becomes beneficial to transmit information about the environment because the, the environment now predicts the environment tomorrow. Well, what you're saying also is that the more times you do that to the generate, like, you know, you said you did it to five generations and you have sort of an increased effect on the HSP90 expression, right? Yeah. So, like, actually, if the environment, it can go on forever until the environment stabilizes, right? Yeah, but the environment is not stable. I mean, this is like an adaptation... I mean, our, our system is, is synthetic, okay? So we don't, it, we're not claiming it's beneficial to the organism in any way. But you can, you can cook up in a computer model situations in which something like this can be beneficial, um, provided that the, the, the time scale over which the environment is changing is longer than the time scale of the generations, then it becomes beneficial to transmit information <laughs> across generations. You know, in humans, it doesn't make any sense because the, the, you know, the generation time is, m not, is massively longer than the time scales of environmental change you know it's not predictive what the temperature was when my mother was born 
for this. It works for famine. <laughs> Do you think? Like a famine? No, people like that, that, that epigenetic memory for um, stress conditions, including maternal stress. Ah, no, biologically you can see these effects, like a very acute starvation in mice and rats, etc., does have an effect on this generation. But, but no one would claim that's adaptive or beneficial. He's asking about whether this is a... If it can be... Well, people, some people may claim that this is adaptive or beneficial, but I do not agree with this. Nava would like me to ask you if you any of you have any more questions. If not, if not, I think we we may <laughs> thank our speakers. Yeah.